threat continuing with standing headlock defenses. We've tried to break this down along a time continuum. How close is getting to you? How far into the technique he is? Obviously, the sooner you begin your defense, the better. But there's a reaction time involved, and it certainly isn't always possible. Once he locks his arms around your neck, and he gets you even bent a little bit where I'm not going to be able to break his posture with my hips, i.e. he's in better control than I am, even if I defend myself properly. We're now in the middle phase of headlock defenses. And that's one of the most common phases. If I see the technique coming, it's, a, you know, it's an early day at the office, I can go home. But most of the time, he's going to get you at least that far or probably on the ground. So let's look at the structure now. I'm caught off guard, he gets me tied up. I want to probably go here, instantly seat belt him. At this moment, it becomes a battle of posture. If he continues pulling my head down, it's getting more and more difficult to defend. So at this moment, I want to start bucking my hips, like we talked about earlier. But my head is already down, he's much tighter, and it's going to be difficult for me to rely just on that. If he tries to pull me off balance, I'm going to have to step with this leg around. Let's look at one way we can fight back for posture. This is the way that we're going to be able to stay in this phase. If he gets my head down, it's going to be more difficult. So here's a technique, again, not commonly taught, but it's essential. This is one I've used in the real world again and again and again in this situation, simply to buy me more time, to give me time to keep my posture right while I look at the options. So as he pulls my head down really hard, I got to step like this to compensate. And more importantly, this hand has to body lock him. Pull him in and push with your head. Now again, because of the weight difference, we're about the same size. It looks like I can outpower him. If we're the same size or even lighter, I probably can. But remember, this is designed against a big, huge person trying to yank me down. I'm going to need every ounce of leverage I have to keep my posture. That's what this is designed for. This isn't a true technique in itself. It's a way to stabilize my situation so I can go to other techniques without having to get my head pulled down farther where it gets more difficult. So once again, he catches me off guard. Don't have time to get my shoulders up. I seat belt him, which is common. Everybody does this. But what I need to do is get better leverage and push with my head this way, my hips this way, and my arms in like this. So as he pulls me, I'm going to step around this way. I'm going to body lock him here, and I'm going to use my head to push this way, my arms to pull in, and my hips to drive on him. Now, even if he's 300 pounds, that should stabilize me enough that I'm not getting my head pulled over. If it does, then I have to go to the next phase. Remember, think about it. To a layman, the headlock is everything. They have control of your head. They feel like it's the most easiest way to control somebody. When I'm teaching this in the classroom situation, I pose this question really simply to people. He puts me in a headlock, and I put him in a body lock, and we stand like this, and I ask the people, who has better control? What's the answer? You do. I do, by a lot. But to the layman, they think the head is more important. But once I lock into his hips, I can pick the guy up, I can throw him, I can move him around. As long as I don't let him pull me down, I have more control. The head is heavy, and it can be hard to, to keep it balanced over your shoulders and hips, but it is not as important as the hips. If I control his hips, I control the center. If he controls my head, he only controls one end of my spine. And the bottom end, the two ends of the spine, your head and your hips, the bottom end is better. Once I'm bent over, then these mechanics change again because it, I can't use my hips, I can't use my head to push, and my arms are so much weaker in here. So remember, that paradigm changes as soon as you're completely uh, in a broken posture position, i.e. your back is bent and your body's 90 degrees to the ground. That's a dangerous position. But we're talking about the mid point of this time continuum here. The sliding scale of danger of the headlock. So the guy gets me in the headlock. I realize that he's, he's very, very strong. I'm not going to have time to do an early defense. I really want to prevent hitting the ground. Maybe there's broken glass, gravel, whatever. So I need to worry about this before I apply the technique. So as he pulls me down, I body lock him and use my head and my hips. My hips are pushing in. My head drives against his shoulder. And I try to out leverage him. Now again, because we're about the same weight, I do have a better position, so it looks like I can outmuscle a guy. Sure, if guys who I outweigh by 20 pounds attack me, yeah, I can have a pretty easy time of it. But we're designing this for if the guy is 300 pounds. Can I stay in that position? If your leverage is good, yes. Let's look at the next step along this sliding scale 
of time. As his uh, headlock gets closer to me, tighter, more difficult to defend. We looked at the initial moment of contact, uh, the next phase to keep our posture. So now he gets me in the headlock and I've managed to keep my posture, but I haven't been able to unbalance him so badly that I'm going to be able to take him down from here. So he's squeezing like this, but I'm able to keep myself upright. Looking up helps pop my hips. I can have my hand here. I can do an old school frame. It's fine. Now a lot of schools teach the kind of thing we're going to attack the face here. This is fine provided that you have good posture. What I think is a largely a waste of time is the idea that once they've broken your posture and they're cranking your head down like this, I'm going to be able to reach up like this. At this moment, keep your shoulder and your chin together. And I'm going to try to push on his head and it's really difficult. This arm is too far extended from my body once I'm bent over. I would really take that out of your self-defense repertoire. If you're trying to poke his eye, whatever, he's just going to move his head and your extended weak arm is just wasting time while he's hammering you in the head or throwing you on the ground. Now that being said, get back in the headlock, if I'm able to protect my posture here by forcing my hips forward, my head up, my arm is a lot closer to his face, it's not extended from my body. In this situation you can use these kind of things because you'll have enough leverage. One that isn't bad and it's still fairly low on the force level, maybe this is your buddy got drunk at a party, you don't really want to hurt him but you want to escape, using this nose kind of thing to make him let go is a good place. Then, as as it pops off, you got to use this hand to help turn them and you circle them right into your guillotine uh -huh. choke. Okay? That's a nice classic one, not taught in every school, but it has its place along that force and time continuum that we're talking about, trying to defend yourself as early as possible. Let's look at it again. The guy comes at me, if he's really early, I can escape. That's my primary escape, putting my shoulders up, not giving him a neck to do a lock on. Secondly, he gets a hold and he starts pulling me in. I got to make sure that I'm protecting my balance. His hands weren't uh, together yet. That's the best time for this thing to happen. All right. Now at this point, maybe he does get his hands together a little bit. Sometimes you can stop it the same way as you would a punch. But if I want to use this inside hand, I have to be in good posture. That means hips forward, head up. Pull me forward. Now he's not very heavy, so it's easy for me to do on camera. If he's extremely heavy, this is going to be tough to do, and we're going to move to the next phase. But let's assume that we can do this. This hand in this position can work. I'm going to use my middle finger. You make a lot of friends this way. And I'm going to go under his nose like this. Yeah, you can look for pressure points that, you know, someone's going to tell you he's going to fall asleep and die in six months from now. But the main idea is to get his head turning. So this one pushes on his nose, and this one helps turn the chin. They're both lever points on your neck because they're sticking out at 90 degrees to your neck. That's why they work, not because there's much magic in there. If I get his head turned far enough and I crank hard, he will let go. Make sure that you're not forgetting about your posture during this. As I turn his head, he wants to turn, but maybe a little hip spin is going to help, and he'll inadvertently roll himself right under your armpit, which is your classic noose position. Also, don't forget to choke him correctly. When I learned these chokes 20 years ago, we were taught this way for example, to noose a guy. The problem is, look at my elbow position. It sticks out, my leverage isn't that good. If I just use a different grip, look at my elbow now. It goes against the side of my body. I get a lot more leverage this way by just changing my grip. There's a lot of ways to do this noose, but if you're trying to do this in an effective way for the street, you want to teach your wife, your kid or something, use a nice, simple grip like this, which really helps. So let's look at this one again. I'm standing here, I feel it coming, but it's around my neck before I get my shoulders up. My next line of defense is to make sure he doesn't pull me over. I'm able to do it. I'm strong in this position with my arm because my, my posture is good, so I may have enough strength to push his head away. If one arm doesn't do it, you use two. That may do it. I can push his chin down and then help roll him into the choke. Avoid grabbing this old school way. I think this hooked grip here is easier and more effective, gives you more leverage. I can pull it up a lot tighter and my elbows against my sides, so everything is a lot stronger. That's the correct way to escape at that time and use a noose choke.